Welcome, travelers. I'm Josh. I'm Glenn. And I'm Lee Wanika. This is Tabletop Journeys, where we will be your humble guides along the journey to RPG adventures. We are all D&D role players and storytellers at heart. It's where we started out, and it's where we find ourselves most at home. So here in our main podcast episodes, we discuss the core rules, how to use them as written, and how to homebrew your own content to get the most out of your story. Because detailed settings, heroic characters, vibrant NPCs, and a focus on story over rules is what makes a campaign legendary. Here's a message from friends of the show. Hey, Danilo from Thinking Critically here. Thinking Critically is a chat show podcast where we take a single concept or idea and discuss what it means within the Dungeons and Dragons framework. Each episode features a different guest from the TTRPG community, and so far I've welcomed actors, designers, and professional DMs. Consider it an NPR style variety bucket of thought provoking analysis and humorous anecdotes, where we cover all sorts of things, including the nitty gritty of how to balance encounters the perception of D&D in popular culture, and the impact it has on mental health. My hope is that each episode helps you get the most out of your sessions, whatever side of the screen you sit on. Find us wherever you get your podcasts and visit me at thinkingcritically.co.uk. Welcome everybody to today's episode. Luanika, Glenn, good evening. How are you? How are things down in uh, What's up? sunny and warmer than Maine, Connecticut? Oh, it was a beautiful day today. Like 40 something, sunny. It did not get above zero yesterday. I was miserable. I didn't leave the chair I'm in other than to the get food and Take care of other business, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm sensing a recurring theme to the evening, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> right? We hope that you all enjoyed our interview with Dale from Wormworks Publishing um, and the Limitless Heroics book that is on Kickstarter right now. Hope that you guys have all funded that. We, over here at, uh, at Tabletop Journeys, though, are coming back to uh, Strixhaven, a curriculum of chaos. And so if you listened to our episode a couple of weeks ago, we talked about all the player and storyteller options in the book that sort of surround the the, the core adventure in the middle of the book. And let's be let's be honest and uh, and admit this that we were pretty critical of that material. I don't want to speak for my illustrious co-hosts here, but we echoed sort of the same feeling that we suspected and hoped that those questions that we had about the material in the outer chapters was supported and fleshed out and elaborated in the quest material. And so we're going to get into the quest material in a characteristic Tabletop Journeys fashion. We're actually going to talk about the quest material in detail tonight and be aware that this episode is definitely uh, spoilerific. And in fact, we're going to talk about that for for just a second, uh, because in our pre-show discussion, Luanika, you were talking about about one of your perceptions of the quest material and the quest itself and your feelings on it. So let's dive in today. As a whole, I liked it. I liked it a lot more than I anticipated I would like I liked it. it more than I thought I would. Yeah. Exactly. Me too. That's a unanimous statement. Yeah. This was actually far better put together than I figured it would be. Not that it doesn't have a couple challenges here or there. Once you come to understand what they were trying to accomplish with this, and thread that very odd needle of make this a campaign and or make these individual standalones and or make these do other things and come back to this point once in a while. And the fact that this can be used with minor alterations to do all three of those things, I think was really good. And it would have been hard to do all of one and be able to do the others without doing it the way they did. I think that's really where we had some challenges, but the issue is because it was not any one of those three things. It was all of those three things. But that said, 
I really enjoyed it. I will go so far as to say I loved it. I enjoyed what I was reading, saw the adventure, saw the potential for fun. And this is where we talk about spoilers. The one thing I would say is having read that for this discussion, I have a wee bit of sadness in that I will never be able to play this game and have as much fun as could be in this game because I now know the details. Yep. And mm. so if anybody's planning on playing the game, hold off on this play first, then listen to this. If we can, yep. we're going to try to do timestamps where we get to certain sections. So at least <laughs> you can listen to this as you get through your various sections. Yep. Uh, it'll also help any storytellers that are out there getting ready to run this so they can move to the section or get back to the section that they're preparing so we can actually talk about some of the things. My goal is to talk about some of the great things to highlight the things that you as a storyteller will want to emphasize or really bring to the fore a little bit more than the adventure brings them up. And then I'm sure between the three of us, we'll talk about some of the things that you may want to downplay or outright change. Mm -hmm. Yep, I would agree with that assessment. Uh, Glenn, how about you? What do you think? Very similar thoughts. Much, much more pleased with the material than I expected to be uh, based on our initial review, though I am going to kind of stand by the things that we said. I'm not going to say yeah. that we were hasty by any means because this is introducing a world and the first two chapters that were for the players and the lore and introducing the world, it, it still struggled a little bit. But the adventure helps bring that world to life more and gives you more of that detail. And is reasonably well crafted in terms of creating an overall school mm -hmm. feel and experience spread out through semesters and finishing out the years and with the exams. And they did a pretty good job coming up with a vibrant cast of NPC classmates to be running around too. So sure. the social sure. structure, et cetera, it could be a whole lot of fun to play. And I definitely agree that if you are interested in playing the game and you want the most out of it, Avoid the spoilers till after you've done, because once you, once you, what's behind some of the stuff, it's going to lose the building mystery that goes Loots throughout a little your bit experience. Of the mystique, yeah. Yeah. I, and in a way that, that kind of reading through the witch light adventure did not actually ruin so much of the plot, right? Like you kind of always knew kind of where it was heading on some level. I, I, I think that here knowing what's happening kind of ruins the enjoyment of playing through it. The mystery is very well crafted. The mystery is crafted like it with the same sort of strength that like the Candlekeep mysteries had, where knowing how those individual chapters ended kind of ruined the running of the mystery. And so I will absolutely agree with you on that front, with both of you on that front. And Glenn, I will also echo your comment about our first episode on this. I absolutely still stand by the criticism that we leveled at this book in our first episode. I did enjoy the adventure slash campaign more than I thought I was going to. I do still think that some of the flaws that we saw in those outlying chapters did continue through the adventure. In particular, I think that there is a lot of very interesting ideas that are not fully formed kind of throughout the campaign. And there are some things that I read and I said, oh, you know what I can do with that? I can do this. And then I realized, but why didn't they just say that, right? Why didn't they just Fair. say that thing? And I, I wish that at some point they had been more explicit with the great ideas that they were throwing out here, because there really are some great ideas in this campaign. I just wish that they'd been a little bit more explicit or a little bit more creative with how they presented them or how to portray them. This is not a, a campaign that a new storyteller will pick up and run with their friends and have it be as good as an experienced storyteller that can realize that they're not talking about a full-fledged building. They're just talking about scaffolding and that there's going to need to be walls and there's going to need to be floors right. and there's going to need to be paint and pictures and all that sort of stuff put into this. Allow me to summarize uh, what you've just, that bit you just said, Josh. Lost Minds of Delver, this ain't. Nope, exactly, exactly. It's not. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, that's kind and of, I say that that's... with great respect. While this is built to bring in new players, I do think it takes a moderately more experienced hand. I yep. don't think you need to have been uh, storytelling for 30 years to do this no. justice, but this is probably not the first or second campaign you run. I'll, no, I'll just say that. Yep. It no. could be. If your whole group is brand new, no one's going to know. You're going to love it. You're going to have fun. 
just lean into the coolness of being at school and having some mysteries and you'll get through it. But a little experience will let you know how much you have to read in advance, i.e. the whole thing. So you know where Twice. each piece is going. Yeah. Uh, and then the night before a given session, how deep you need to get into each of those things, preparing your D&D Beyond encounters with the characters that are here, uh, all of those things. So everything's kind of at your fingertips. This is really one that your prep time is going to be a little heavier to make it run very smoothly or to make it feel smooth for your players. But there's a lot of reward for your players. I, I truly think as a player, this would be a lot of fun. This is also not a big campaign group. Like we, the three of us run large groups. We run six, eight people. We've seen with friends of the show running eight, 10, sometimes more. This is really well formatted for a four to five. Six is tough, I think, with this. I think six would be a challenge here to give everybody their adequate spotlight um, yep. because there are not a ton of pieces as far as adventures. There's a finite number of adventures here. If you've got six players, you as a storyteller had better be crafting some additional encounters, some additional sections within the framework that they provide, which they do a good job of, so that everybody gets that moment to shine. Yeah. Right. And there's plenty of room for that. And honestly, that's part of what made me enjoy it so much, because you're definitely right. A lot of those flaws def definitely continued throughout the book. But a large part of what made me enjoy it and a large part of made me what made me decide that I might actually want to run it is I'll play. how much it activated my imagination, how much it started stories going off in my head, because that's how you bring me in. Yep. And a large part of the fun for it, aside from the social structure that they've built, which we'll get into in a little bit, and the adventures themselves, is that each chapter is going to take place over multiple sessions, and it's rife with opportunity to just slip in additional plot lines, additional scenes to help you know flesh out the story in general with whatever ideas it sparks in your imagination. And that's part of what I really liked about it. So yeah, it is very much a building blocks and a bare bones one at that in some ways, but it gives you so much flexibility because you got a whole semester, but only three events. And I will go so far as they, like any show based in a school, they go over summer break. Everybody comes back, but I'm just now wrapping up the last final episodes of star girl season two. And I'm thinking who wanted to do a summer school session? There's stuff here. You could do that. Or better yet, one of the characters or a couple of the characters pretend are, are built with a background. They don't come from a home. They're orphans or whatever. And so they go home for the summer with one of the other characters. So now you go back to that character's hometown and you have some adventures in town or what have you. I can see those things happening. And then you come back to school. I think there's a lot of opportunities. You could do a spring break because you imagine, and they didn't, they did not do that. I, that's one of the things I wish they had some kind of spring break thing. That would have been cool. Uh -huh. oh, you could totally do a spring break trip to like the beaches of some severely dangerous. Some like uh, some tropical Daytona beach. island. Or how about with their extracurriculars, you could build in work semester, summer semester abroad. So you go to some other academy, like perhaps yep. you Candle Keep. Can't go to Candle Keep for a uh, yeah. summer abroad or with mm -hmm. or. You're working with one of your professors, so they're at Candle Keep. So you go, and then you partake with other people. Summer in internship. Yeah. Right? There's all kinds of ways this could go. There is a lot of really cool, and I actually think that a Strixhaven Candle Keep crossover would be really great. I can think of a lot I of really great it. ways that, that could go. But let's let's go ahead and dive into uh, to the book itself here. I want to start tonight with the... So we're, we're going to start, obviously, with Chapter 3, School and Session, and there's a lot of preamble to this chapter. Characters are coming in Level 1, but there's a lot of kind of background about how these chapters are going to run. Let's talk first about the relationship and extracurricular and job mechanics that they have, because those all kind of interplay with one another. Right. What did we think about those? What did you think about that in general? So I really like what they're trying to do, and... They even came up with this tracking sheet that you can use for all your characters. Each person keeps track of their own stuff as you go throughout your your 
academic career uh, and it'll run throughout the campaign where you keep track of your relationships and your extracurriculars and things it's almost like a character sheet supplement that's pretty groovy it's handy that they made that giving you a way it's to really, track yeah. it was a great idea because the system while it's not complicated there's a fair amount to it and it's like a many rules overlay but i dig it I've always been a fan of honor systems and reputation tracking for factions mm -hmm. or even just how well NPCs in town like you. And they've basically taken that with some window dressing and turned it into a relationship tracking system for the various NPC students that you're sharing the college with. And it's up to you as to whether or not you have positive or negative interactions with them, but they can move from a neutral student to being a rival or a friend or even a beloved, which doesn't necessarily mean romantic relationship. It could be completely platonic. It could be a sibling type relationship. You just care very deeply for each other. You're really close. And there are benefits that you get from this. And it's actually groovy. The beloved actually gives you beloved dice at the beginning of each long rest or at the end of each long rest, you get a number of beloved rerolls. But the mechanics yeah. are kind of cool. The system that they came up with to keep track of it is easy to use. And aside from the fact that the NPCs, when they move from friend to rival, the Banes and Boons, mm, they could be fun, but they could also be complicated. So storytellers, I'd really say it's kind of up to you as to when you use them. Like for one of them, if you make somebody your enemy, anytime you perform on college, uh, hecklers show up just to boo you. Yeah. And that could be a little bit of a downer if you make that guy an enemy and you can never get him back and you're trying to become a bard. And that's just going to you know, only use it when you need it, when the rival needs to. Don't make it every time, you know, use yep. your best judgment. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah. yeah. Josh, forgive me for stealing some of your thunder because we had a discussion about this. We did have a discussion about uh, this, yeah. And, and I will say lines and veils. We talk about it all the time and I'm going to throw out the reminder here. Make sure your session zero covers these types of things. Different people have different experiences in various type levels of school, whether it be elementary, middle school, high school, college, or across the world, whatever your equi uh, equivalent secondary school and so on and so forth would be. Yep. And they're not all 100% the same. So some of the things that show up in these banes versus the boons can potentially be triggering. And while for Fair some point. folks... That may not be a big deal because you didn't experience those types of things from the negative end of things. You need to be aware that might be for somebody else. So take heed as you lean into this. And because it is that school experience that we're talking about that a lot of us hold very dear to us, I would strongly recommend that when you do that session zero, at least as it relates to the boons and banes, you might want to do some kind of questionnaire so people don't feel on the spot talking about that in public if they're not quite ready to do. Yeah. That's just my take on it. Uh, I mean, that's, that's probably why I was feeling a little bit alarmed by it and trying to give my disclaimer, but I hadn't yep. fleshed it out anywhere near that coherently. Very nice. Yeah. So I will, I will apologize in advance if I'm not coherent because the Banes were something for me. Were I ever to run this, they would not be in my game because I don't think any of them are any fun. I don't think any of them are an element that I would want at my table. And not only for the potential triggering aspect, which is very real and a very serious concern. I just, I find it hard to make it fun that the campus gossip paper writes horrible things about one of my players. I find that hard to sound, to make fun. Uh, I find you are a pariah on the campus role-playing scene. The worst monsters are named after you. I find that hard to make that fun. I think that I will go out and say that the Banes as they are written would not have any place at my table. And if my players want them, my table is not the one for them to sit at, right? That, that's not the game that I want to run where these are things. And that's pretty much my feelings on that have, have kind of succinctly de devolved down to that, so... Thank you for that. I really appreciate you stepping in and giving us that internal monologue about that because it's important and I appreciate that greatly. I agree with you. Some of the Banes I have significant issues and concerns with and I would not necessarily use at all. Like they just writ large would not be in my game either. There are others that I think I would significantly alter, change, or provide zero detail to. For instance, the campus paper writes something about you. The only way I could even remotely make that fun is to make it 100% mechanical and give no narrative weight to it whatsoever. Literally, 
this disadvantage in these situations and talk about it not is the only way I could ever do that. And I wouldn't yeah. even necessarily like that because I'm yeah, so it's not fun either, driven. Yeah, I, I, I don't well, like you know, I don't I don't like penalizing players for it either. Exactly. That's almost worse. So <laughs> I think that there are there is we play all have play and have played so many different games. We make so many different roll tables of things that have negative implications or repercussions or things that can be and are exceptionally fun. We had great pleasure writing co the collaborative world building book. And some of those one rolls on that are not happy things, but nope. they were fun to write and made for interesting role playing choices to follow. So I think the answer for me is use the system, toss what's there, create things that I would find enjoyable that have that take on it. That's right. kind of where I would probably end up with this. But again, even with that, because of the nature of what it is and people's upbringing, people's school times are important to them. It all comes down to those lines and veils. Right. All that to say that I think that Glenn, you're, you were spot on when you said it's actually a really cool system. The way that I felt about the Banes aside, the yeah, relationship with Canon just is just a really, it's an interesting overlay onto the characters. And I think that there could be a lot of, there could be a lot of interesting role play situations that are spawned from that whole mechanic. I, I loved the job mechanic. I thought that the extracurriculars were fun, all that sort of stuff. I, I really thought that was, uh, that was very well done in general and would be an interesting mechanic. This is something that, that Dungeons and Dragons has been chasing for a very long time that other systems have that sort of rapport, um, some relationship mechanic. And I think that for a first, I think this is probably the first time that it's been documented in like canon D and D. Maybe third edition had one, but no, it wasn't second yeah. edition. Carter sort uh, of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's right. The Oriental Adventures game had yep. a had a honor, honor system, system yep. that was pretty yep. spiffy overall. Yep. I remember I used to play a couple games where we ported that in and used that for a reputation system. And I believe Dragonlance had something similar to that as well, yep. but certainly for the Knights of Salamnia, but that was pretty interesting, but it had a lot of holes in it. This, I think, is plugged much better. It literally comes down to the mechanic is fine, but the specific banes, those individually yep. are not fine. They needed to write right. better ones yep. of those, but keep the rest, keep the whole yep. system, write better banes. Write better banes, yeah. We talked a lot about the relationship tracking system and we mentioned a couple other things in there a lot that didn't get a lot of detail like the extracurriculars and the jobs just to give you a little bit of detail on that each semester your character can either participate in two extracurriculars or one extracurricular and one job and you get different benefits for them too and this creates lots and lots of extra scene fodder and minor plots plot development opportunities for the storytellers out there because they did a pretty good job coming up with the extracurriculars. They're pretty fun. You got everything from the Fantastical Horticulture Club to the Live Action Role Players Guild. Which I thought and was each, hysterical that D&D &D has, has a LARP group. Of course, a LARP group and <laughs> a role-playing game at the college, but what college doesn't have a LARP group? So exactly, it makes total right, sense. Yeah. You got the Strixhaven Iron Lifter Society, and all of these have two skills associated with them that by being a, a participant in, you basically get advantage. You get extracurricular inspiration on skill rolls for those specific skills and you get a d4 that you can add to a role is what you get from your extracurricular so which extracurricular you choose also makes a difference in how you know it's going to impact your skill set and what advantages it gives you all right let's move on to what i thought was one of the most interesting mechanics in that they introduced in this game and that's the exam mechanic i thought so similar to the relationship mechanic, right? The exam mechanics allow you to basically gain bonus dice for particular skills. I right. thought that the exam mechanic was really kind of cool. It really fleshed out the college feel of everything going on. This is kind of the biggest missed opportunity for me, though. The way that okay, I, I wonder if you and I are on the same page on this here. Go because, ahead, we'll find so, out. So I was, I was I was talking about it with with my wife and my son who is in college, and I said, okay, imagine that you are in an academy run by magical dragons full of wizards and mages and sorcerers of every stripe and every variety, right? And you are taking a class all about your ability to write glyphs specifically to make wards and stuff like that. And they're like, okay, 
I'm like, okay, you have to take an exam in that class. How do you think that exam would take place? Do you think that you would be transported to a bubble of safety with a challenge where you need to yes. write your glyph and write your ward and do it correctly in a real world scenario? Practical option exams. A, or option B, a multiple choice test with an essay, right? With a so, single die roll to decide. Yeah. And a single die roll. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm exactly where you are. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> I am exact, or I was exactly where you are, but I have a bit more nuanced feel to it now that we're talking this through. I think you're right overall, especially when you look at year three, year four, because that's in college where you start doing practicum. But year one and year two is likely to be paper exams before you get to practicum. So I can almost see both ways, and it just depends on how nitty gritty you want to go with it. Yeah. And keeping in mind that they are giving you one exam out of all of the exams that your characters are likely yep. to take during the course right, of no. the year. And my biggest problem is that fact. I did not feel the exams had enough to do with the story content. One in oh, particular, the first exam did. The, uh, the first exam. Yeah tied itself into the quest and you got bonuses later in the quest if you had done well on the exam. Yep. And that was a feature that I liked. So yep. I'm going to agree with you. That didn't continue as it moved on. That's where I fell, I fell down for me is I thought if I have to Two go missed opportunities. and it's big, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And, I, and it's big because it's in every single year and it's a huge, yeah. big thing. It's actually almost every single chapter or whatever. Why isn't it tied more to the quest? Yeah. Think about Raceland's test. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of thing I was imagining when they were talking about exams. Maybe not to the point of Raceland's because that was big. That was brutal um, as F. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't just a single class. But I was exactly where you are. I think every exam was an opportunity to have created another encounter, to create a practical encounter, or just like the other mishaps that are going on campus, and a practical that should have been completely safe. But due to the, the magical mishaps that are already happening, it turned suddenly dangerous. To make yeah. them just be a skill check and not even a skill challenge. The studying mechanic I thought was kind of cool because y'all can study. And if you study, you get advantage on your roles in the exams, which makes a difference because how well you pass the exam can play into it, into some of the things when it does right. move on. Because in the instance where it does, you only get the bonus if you aced it. But it was a huge missed opportunity to one, tie in, absolutely. And yep. two, create more Make them a little actually cooler. fleshed out cool encounters yeah. to flush it out and that could have created more of that sauce in the story we're talking about that's you know? exactly like that's the big thing that i thought that this was missing was a better exam ex i, I don't want to say a better exam mechanic because i thought mechanically the exam things were fine was what they wrote like, it, what they wrote is better good. Ex better exam execution is what i was looking for and even things like the the mechanical detriment for failing exams again i don't want to be the guy that keeps going back to watch your lines and veils on this and you know look having pretty significant negatives for failing one of your exams yeah. hard to Basically. make that fun Basically, you know? if you fail an exam, you're required to attend tutoring, which takes away any extracurriculars right. and jobs you have until you pass an yep. exam. So and for the rest of the party. For the rest of an entire, not just session, but set of sessions, because it's like the whole yeah. semester or much later in the yep. semester before you get to the next exam. Yep. This is an area where I think they did a great job of mirroring and creating verisimilitude with yep. college. Yes. They did. But- it doesn't necessarily equate to fun. To fun. Right. You think about some of, yeah. Some of the stuff that happens yeah. in school isn't fun and you can't make it right. fun. No, so exactly. That's exactly where I'm going with that is that, that you don't have to have everything in a sense of realism in a game like this. And all that to go ahead and say, again, I think that this first chapter in The Adventure Path does a really good job of not only laying out how the quests are going to run, but this first adventure is nothing to sneeze at. It's solid. I liked the, the puzzle pieces. I liked the exploration pieces. I liked the combat pieces. I thought that those were all really great. I think that some of the role play opportunities are 
storyteller to single player opportunities. And I would have liked to go ahead and see more group activities, more group role play activities as opposed to being kind of one off. Like you, you think about like the jobs, right? Like I may have a job at Jolt Cafe, but mm-hmm. what are you guys going to be doing while I'm there working and I'm doing my thing with the storyteller? So I, I think that. Right. I think to your point, Lewinik, about how it's perfectly built for parties of four and five, I think if you've got a party of eight and seven people are uninvolved in a 15-minute scene, that's problematic. Not to downplay your statement because you're absolutely correct. And with a smaller group, what you actually get to do with this based on the scenes as written in this book, and of course with encounters that you take from the randoms or that you create, is you get to create sessions where everybody has their 15 minutes, but they don't necessarily all have to be in it in every session. Right. So as long as you as a storyteller are spreading the wealth, spreading that storyteller, this is your job time. You have the opportunity to really highlight. I actually just had a thought. This goes perfectly with our episode that we did about how to take your game beyond the table and to bring it into things like online media, in-between game sessions, stuff like that. I think that is exactly the way that you can go ahead and do this without having it interfere with your game sessions. So That would be a wonderful way to run any of those side encounters with a job or an extracurricular, 100%. Yep, yep. You do that on the side conversation, and then when everybody's together is just that, when everybody's together. I have a sense that's how this was designed, but they didn't, again, explicitly say that. I wanted to mention a couple things just to throw them in here because we just finished our Wormwood ex- episode and it goes to air two days mm-hmm. after we record this. I wanted <laughs> to talk about the Strixhaven accessibility. It was something that was mentioned early on. It was highlighted in a way that when you're reading it as a storyteller, it was right there for you to read what's there. And mm-hmm. I wanted to mention that it was a great, it was a good job. It was a good effort. It was well noted and appreciated. And repeated. Um, regularly and when it's talking about accessibility for each building so it's yeah they did a good job with that and totally agree as a group of individual storytellers who are part of community that we're ever trying to expand we truly appreciate seeing that explicitly stated i also wanted to talk when we were talking about the jobs i also wanted to mention at the cafe uh i really wanted to try the toasted cockatrice gizzards on rye that just oh, the tasty. sandwiches were gross, and they were awesome. I like. So I want to try that. So, all right, <laughs> the sandwiches in the Bibliotech <laughs> Cafe. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because I put it right into our Tabletop Journeys chat when I was talking to Josh about it. Yeah, you um, did. Because <laughs> the Bibliotech Cafe, where the, this thing opens up with you going to basically freshman orientation, right? When it's being held in the Bibliotech, the big central building on campus, giant library, which, based on the description in the campaign, does not have stacks so tall to have their own weather systems or a giant swamp inside the library you'll note but that was in the first part which is weird yeah i did notice that when i talk about a missed opportunity it's not necessarily missed <sighs> maybe redirected would have been better because it's kind of cool right you got the bibliotech cafe it's got this one blurb in this section when it's describing it and it has a different sandwich feature every day it's kind of neat and it's definitely got flavor so to speak because they're sandwiches but i just can't help but wonder (laughs) if maybe the print space and the effort could have gone somewhere with a little bit more substance than sandwich names even the fact that there are only six that there's supposedly a new sandwich every day and there's only six of them i was was tickled by the sandwiches that's not like a bitch against the sandwiches per se (laughs) it's more that i really think that they could have given us a little bit more meat on that bone than six different sandwich names if they were going to come up with this. Do you want early access to every Tabletop Journeys episode? How about exclusive content, live broadcasts, and the chance to throw dice with your favorite hosts and fellow fans? Or, heck, do you just want to support the show? Join our Patreon today at www.patreon.com slash ttjourneys. We have tiers to fit any budget for a monthly commitment, or you can make a one-time contribution to the cause. We love doing the show for y'all, and support helps us keep creating and producing great content for you. So join us today at www.patreon.com slash ttjourneys. Did you 
you guys think about this uh, this kind of first chapter? How do you think it started the uh, the adventure? How do you think it laid out? I think it did a great job of taking you through a basic layout and an introduction to the school. Right there in the first part of the bibliotheque, which is where you're going to spend a lot of time, you got exploration that'll take you all over it as long as yeah. you, if you choose to. The orientation gives you a scavenger hunt that's specifically about going to all of the locations yep. to familiarize great. yourself with. Great. And through, spread throughout the library are most of the extracurricular activity societies recruiting. So like it was written really well in terms of it felt great as a introduction to your new life on campus. I thought it was I thought it was pretty groovy. Yep. And then the magical kerfuffles that happen, of course, that you have to help resolve. My one concern, the way that it's written is what if your party is not the step uppers? Expand on that. OK, so. You're in the bibliotheque. This chaos breaks out, right? Because the Shimura cutout in the play comes to life and starts attacking people. You're in a magical university. The way it's written is the expectation is this specific party of players steps up and immediately fights this Shimura, mm -hmm. while everyone else, from students to professors, flees in terror. There's the social contract of you, you are sitting down to cooperate and play the game. But I, 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 <laughs> we're talking about looseness. A lot of the lead ends I felt were a little bit weak. Yep. I wouldn't say weak. How's that? I would say they're a bit railroady ish in, in this manner. They become real roady because they're weak. If they weren't weak, they wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Okay. Be. Six, one, half dozen, the other. I truly believe that. When you're doing your session zero, you're going to have to, as a storyteller, if you're running this, let the party know. Look, yeah, the you adventure the is done in such a way that the expectation is you are the step uppers. You are the people who run towards the fire, not away from the fire. Literally need you to do that in order for you to get the full benefit and enjoyment out of this game. And I would just explicitly say that in the beginning. And I think if you're selecting the right players who are interested in this kind of game, because those players, not every player is going to be interested in this kind of game. Yeah. In an upcoming actual play game that, that I will be storytelling, it's a modern game, but it is an organization where it's a strike team. Nearly all the characters are going to be military in nature. They are going to be the ones that do the, they're those guys. They can have any number. And I, when we build characters, which will be recorded and for everybody to listen to, they'll be able to see how those characters get built and within that framework. But the given is this team does the thing. They get the, the orders, orders yeah. they execute the orders, they take on the missions. Where they fall morally, all that stuff, that's the role play. But they're the ones that want to do the thing. And if that's your party who doesn't do that, then you can run that in the background. You could always run the campaign where Bad stuff just happens. Maybe the people that they have relationships when bad things happen throughout this adventure are the ones that don't survive. That's, yeah. When your relationship points go away, not because you did anything wrong, but because that person yeah. got, maybe they'll step up next time, I guess. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what to say. You could no, probably you, it, run the campaign without letting them do that because they have written in there what happens if the parties fall down or who, who will pick up if the party like doesn't too. take part of it. Yep. So. I, and I kind of like those backups. Uh, they did a That's really a great job. Lobby, but yeah. Yeah. They did a lot of, especially in the early levels, they did a lot of good backup, which I think was for narrative reasons. Your first level. This is a college run by ancient dragons. Yeah. There's right. got to be somebody who would handle this. Well, and then in the very end of the last quest, when they say, if you succeed, here's what's happened. If you fail, here's what happened. And it's like when you talk about like how they could have spent the inches that they spent on coming up with sandwiches in other places, I think that's a place that could have used additional inches, but we'll get there in a little bit. Last thing that I want to go ahead and say about this first quest here is that something that I saw in all four quests, inevitably there is one scenario at least in every one of these that I looked at and said, oh, you know what? This scenario in a box is wonderful. I can lift this and bring it someplace else. I can bring it to another game. And I thought Sedgemore in particular, that whole layout with Sedgemore with the swamp and the everything that they had in there, I thought was absolutely fabulous. And that was very much uh, a recurring theme throughout there. 
being homebrew style storytellers, we're looking for things that we can lift and bring into other places. I wish that I had read through this book because uh, the last AP chapter that I ran uh, had a swamp encounter. I wish that I'd had Sedgemore because I thought that, that would be that there's a lot of things in there that could be really cool in a swamp. I'm lifting silver, silver quill uh, whole cloth. I just absolutely love that college. Cool. <laughs> like, like, that's the college yeah, I want. There's, there's, Right. There's plenty in here. And the stuff yeah. that they did come up with to help tie it together as it went through, though, was pretty good. Like the Eldritch Bomb being the cause of everything here in this first chapter, I thought was... That was well written. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. I couldn't decide exactly what word I wanted to use, but I thought that was <laughs> um, an excellent choice because it's, diggity. it's a magical elixir that they make in the college. Uh, yeah. That they rub on everything. And it happens to get corrupted by the evil mastermind by behind big, it all. if you're yeah. running the campaign if you're not then it gives you ways to break it down also a very well crafted thing they did with this book they gave you here's here's the cause if here's an alternate cause if you're not yep. running it as a campaign i thought that was brilliantly done i have not seen that i'm aware of before but this is one of the first campaign modules i've read thoroughly for the purposes of discussion I really enjoyed that particular element of, the, of this book. Let's go on to chapter four, uh, Hunt for Mage Tower. Again, I thought in general, a nice adventure. I thought that it had really interesting pacing. I thought that, again, it had a lot of like liftable pieces that, that encounters that didn't have to kind of stay within within this chapter here. I thought in particular the combat at the end of this chapter, basically after the game of Mage Tower, when the party is attacked right after, I mm -hmm. thought was, we've talked about this before in our combat pillar episode, where that's a great place to put a combat. You put them into a thing where they can use their spells for reputation points, right? And try to go ahead and win the game. And isn't that great? And then as soon as they get back to the locker room, you attack attack them. <laughs> they don't even make it off the field in this. I, I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> I, I, I think you definitely do have to take some care to see how that's going to work and hopefully by that point you'll have done enough encounters to know where your party is. Something we didn't mention, there are for every chapter, for every section, a list of random encounters. Mm -hmm. I would strongly recommend. I don't usually do a lot of random encounters in my games because of the way I structure my homebrew games. But if I were to be running this, I would strongly consider running at least one of these random encounters per section. Oh, yeah. Uh, and very early on, to get, it'll largely be so you get to know how your party works, so you have a better feel of what you can put them up against and how you can play up or play down to your party's strengths and or weaknesses. Yep, totally agree. Because and it's it's actually a really integral part of the not just the character's kind of development, but also the plot of what's going on in general and make sure that these random things keep happening on campus. I thought that this chapter again, it followed along really well uh in terms of taking you through what's going on the campus right up to ac the practice session. My biggest issue with this one is I don't envision the game of Mage Tower very well. It's capture the flag, but with moving stuffed animals of various sizes. <laughs> that bite and poke. Yeah. And you're not allowed to hurt the other players. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's combat or PvP. Yep. Right? So it's a bunch of mages running around periodically using spells as distraction, but overall trying to out-rugby each other for moving stuffed animals. The game Mage Tower didn't speak to me. The story that leads throughout this semester and up to the Mage Tower game, and I get what you're trying they're trying to do. They're trying to have that tri wizard tournament to go Harry Potter wise yeah. or whatever other school competition you've got going on where you have your teams clash and Mage Tower, they tried to make it really cool. It didn't work for me, I'm sorry. I like all the story that goes with it, but the sport just kind of it, it honestly kind of ruined this chapter for me. I didn't really get it. Similar to your thoughts on that. I had a struggle, like I must have reread this section three or four times trying to grasp a vision of this game. I play chess so I can envision 3D chess, right? And I can figure out how that works, even though I, I, I would not be very good at it. There are different games. Harry Potter's Quidditch. I struggled with that a little bit too. I'm not the world's greatest Harry Potter fan. I enjoyed the movies. It was a decent movie. I'm not like all in. My kids probably be very angry to hear that from me. 
And don't at me, Harry Potter fans. It may be the song of my people, but it is just not the song of this person, right? But I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed a lot of elements of it. But Quidditch just never hit for me. I got what it was supposed to be, and I figured that out. And to me, this was a lot like that. It just felt, this is the game I'm supposed to understand, and it's supposed to be exciting, and it's supposed to be the big thing. But there's nothing about this game that I find exciting. That's kind of it. It should have taken. It should take place on like a big field that has magic suppression and other enchantments in place to prevent like student death. But I should be allowed to magic missile that guy and take it and half take him out so I can get my dude back. And we're a college of mages. It's kind of the same thing that I was saying about the exams, right? It's yes, you're right. You are absolutely right, Luanika, that when you're in college, practical exams normally don't come until your third year. And were I actually attending a college of mages and wizards that's run by dragons, I would call BS on the fact that I had to take a multiple choice exam my freshman year. When I was reading through this chapter, I guess the part that seemed least interesting was the whole Mage Tower game. It was that was just a red herring for something else. It was any anything could have been the placeholder for the Mage Tower game. They got me excited about a game called Mage Tower, and then they <laughs> let me down. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. But as yep. I said, the rest of the plot that's written throughout this chapter, the way it's great. The chapter is yeah. well done. It's the game and the game mechanics that I think was soft. Yep. But let's talk chapter five then. The Magister's Masquerade. I'll be honest. This is the so kind of like how like the game of Mage Tower didn't resonate with you guys. This chapter did not resonate for me. I I, I thought that I don't know. I thought that the whole concept of it kind of sounded a little contrived, and I didn't quite grasp on how I would run it. It was the core thing of the Masquerade though that I didn't love. The plot that interwove through it, I thought was fantastic. Again, same I thing. I just didn't think it was executed. I didn't think it was executed well. So I liked it. And the reason I liked it is because a, a little wish fulfillment, right? I never went to either of my proms. Mm -hmm. uh, I did attend a prom after I graduated high school. I was invited back. The uh, young lady I was seeing who was, had invited me to take her to the prom. So I took her to the prom and I enjoyed that moment. And I thought of it like that. The last job I worked, we had this thing that we did before in the before times where they would gather everybody for what we called a gala. Everybody would dress up. We'd go out. I like that concept. And and I think while that is more of a uniquely high school than college oriented thing, I liked its placement here. I think it fit the story they told in this chapter better than it would have fit any of the stories in any of the other chapters, though I was a bit lost and didn't care that much for the fashion show element of it. But as far as, hey, everybody's going to this event and that's where bad things are going to happen. Buffy happened at her prom. Carrie happened at their prom. When it comes to bad things happening in a school environment, the song of our people screams, there has to be an happen at the prom. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so in that in that regard, I thought it was well placed and I enjoyed that element of it. I think it can be, depending on how in or a storyteller takes their players and how involved their players are with the various relationships, whether it's hey, me and my buddy, we go stag, we're gonna we're going to put some rock gut in the punch or we're going to do these various crazy shenanigans, college shenanigans. This was had a lot of elements that could be very enjoyable and fun for folks. And I like that element. I, I like this chapter because of that. I think much more so than Mage Tower as a set piece within a well-crafted adventure. I liked this set piece. I kind of land between the two of you, which is familiar Our, territory, because I agree. It, the masquerade ball, the dance thing, it didn't speak to me as much as it could have, but it wasn't as bad as mage ball because or mage tower, because I can envision it and I can see it fitting in. So it didn't throw me like, what the hell is this? But it was more of a, okay, I could try to make this fun. And as long as I have the right players and they're into it, I can work with a dance or a party. I do like a good party. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> and known. Ben, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were some things, and, and the plot, I agree, again, is interwoven well and fits the concept of the dance. And you're going to get attacked again, guys. So there's no secret there, right? Sure. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe it's appropriate because a lot of times dances or proms are a little bit chintzy and tropey. Yep. Tropey. And, I like tropey. 
And yeah, as I'm scrolling through the beginning of it, the reception activities that they came up with for bar games and drama, etc., didn't do anything for me. The third year rumor mill didn't do anything for me. So like a lot of the like social dressing they tried to come up with in it really didn't feel that good. I um, didn't mind the rumors, but it was very obvious which ones were going to be true before I even read which ones came true. Which is why they were, they're crap. They're a waste of print. Yeah, because you could just reading them. Which ones are ridiculous? Why? And, and, why? And to to build on a, on a point that you, rumors. Yeah, and to build on a point that you said you were talking about earlier with the uh, the one too many kind of subplot there, where one of the people at the ball gets sick and. Like you're supposed to, as the party, be like, oh, why are they sick? Let me go investigate that. We've all been to a party where someone takes ill. Like, they don't want a crowd of people around them when they're barfing in the Rose Garden, hypothetically, right? That's not like that's, they don't want a crowd of people around them. They're having a singular moment and deserve a little bit of privacy at that moment in time. Even if you've convinced them that they're going to be the step uppers, just because your best friend's puking in the bushes again yeah. because he drank too much isn't. Yeah cause to step up I, there's I'm the step not uppers sure. and the hair holders yeah, exactly yeah. right <laughs> right there, there's a, there's a significant difference there as a player i'm not sure i would have gone there no exactly it sounds like a red herring so i will say uh the one thing that i again i talked about this in chapter two with chapter three i loved the whole thing surrounding fury gale the whole bit where there's this place that feuding stuff Students of Strixhaven have gone for magic feuds and the walls Dueling. are infused with magic. And oh, I absolutely loved it. You want to talk about 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 lair and environmental conditions and stuff like that. That's what this is. It's absolutely fabulous. Yes. Amazing. Yes. That was the best part of the ch- honestly, it's one of the best written parts. It's one of the best parts in the, in the entire thing. In, in the yeah. book. Yeah, but again, so that's three chapters in now. I think that our listeners are getting a theme about what we feel about this, that every chapter had a redeeming quality to it. Some more than one. It's got gems. Yeah. Yeah, there's... the uh, And a I bunch of say, other crap. And I think that's where <laughs> the quandary right. came in for me at the beginning when I was saying that this really stepped up my like for the book as a whole because yeah. some of the stuff that we're talking about, they're not only strong parts of these adventures, they're hands down just freaking great just great and it's they're saddled with lifting these other stuff and let me tell you some of these scenes are doing some heavy lifting just to to give the writers a little bit of credit yeah. when you're trying to write a campaign that's going to span across an entire year of school knowing that there's going to be countless other events that show up they it's got to be a little bit loose and it's it, it can't have too much detail or it would be 700 page book right and so you got to expect it a little bit of elbow grease getting into a campaign that takes o- place over this long a, a specific time frame as opposed to just adventure after adventure yeah knowing that you've got to stretch this out over a year the last thing that I'll say about chapter three is we alluded to this earlier storytellers who are looking to run this make sure you go into this prepared make sure that you're going into this uh knowing what you're going to do because i think that it is pretty critical that the cliffhanger at the end of chapter 5 ends a session it has to end the session i you can't it's you could have some brackish midwater between chapters 1 and chapter 2 where you know maybe there's a little bit of transition in there or you recap something from chapter 1 and blah 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 or that kind of thing but the reveal of who the bad guy is in the dean's repository at the end of chapter 5 that's a cliffhanger that you want to milk for everything that it's worth mm. so if that means your session runs a little long or your session's a little short you've got to accept that. I think that is that is really one of the big things that you've got to go ahead and nail to make it worthwhile to your players. And that's good advice anytime you're running any kind of an ending that's got a cliffhanger to it. Or yep. honestly, if you spent forever designing the super ultra epic boss encounter, timing to make sure that you fit it into the session as opposed yeah. to rushing it at the end is, is important. You know, be, even because like chapter six begins with the entire atmosphere of the College of Strixhaven having changed, right? right? Everyone is dour, everyone is sullen, everyone is scared, everyone is all these things. 
to really make that effective. I was going to say, yeah, exactly. somebody's going to have to fill me in, but I remember that there's a moment in Harry Potter, one of the movies ends and the tone of the entire film series changes from that point forward. It stops being uh, lighthearted with moments of terror or moments of adventure and becomes, we're in this now. Yeah. <laughs> so you really have to know that's coming to the point that Josh made in what I said earlier about what you have to read in advance and where you have to put your bookmarks. D&D Beyond has the ability to lock in certain things. Uh, bookmark that spot. If, if it looks like you're going to get to it too early in the night, put in the extra encounter. Drop that random encounter in there to kind of get you through or throw in that extra relationship conversation to eke out an extra cut three, four, maybe 15 minutes. Maybe a random staff member comes by and strikes up a conversation with the party. And honestly, there's no purpose other than you're creating a role-playing event to stall different techniques to get you to that end, but know where that end is. My Monday night homebrew campaign, they know I am notorious for, for great cliffhangers. And I yep. do that very carefully in a very plotted fashion. I know where I want my cliffhangers to be. Yep. Chapter six, the reckoning in ruins, the capstone adventure in this campaign. We can hit all the checkboxes that we've talked about in the other three chapters. There are encounters in this that are exceptionally liftable. I think that the concept of a, a detention bog is uh, hysterical. I loved it. I thought that was just a really, oh no, you messed up. You get to go spend a night in the bog of eternal stench. Like I think that's a fantastic uh, way to go ahead and do it. I absolutely love it. Absolutely no. love it. And I, I thought that there were, again, some missed opportunities in here, right? I get why they did it, but like at the when the when the chapter changes, when it's okay, nope, we're no longer at college. Now you guys need to go take care of the problem. You know what the problem is. You're the only ones that are strong enough to do it. That whole, hey, have your one final moment with all of your relationships and even your rivals appreciate you. And I I, I thought that was just a little too This is a little cheesy. It was really Trope. just a little cheesy. A little tropey. Yeah, it, it, it leaned all the way in. It leaned yeah. in hard. It really yeah. did. It really did. And that's okay. Sometimes tropes yeah. are good. You can always vary that ending yeah. a little bit. There's nothing wrong I with suppose. that. I suppose. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. But this is a chapter full of really interesting stuff, like the the protective muck in the meditation alcove. I thought it was a really interesting magic item. The concept that if you cover yourself in this muck, you gain uh, 1d4 plus one temporary hit points for an hour. And any temporary hit points that you have at the end of that hour, you take necrotic damage. <laughs> It was one of those things, like, we talk a lot about magic items versus cursed items, right? This is kind of a magic item that has a magic and a detriment, a detrimental effect at the same time. I'm not sure that I've ever seen anything quite like that. When they're in the when they're in the ruins, the necrotic locus again, kind of one of these weird mystical items. The in the middle of the fortress is a disgusting orb of bone, flesh, and necrotic energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just thought that was pained oh, well, eyes yeah, bulge from a five foot diameter sphere of glistening muscle, ashen skin, and yellowed bone. Oily vapor issues from six mouths on the surface of the sphere, which sits pulsing on the ground. That's just amazingly gross, and it's fantastic. No, they went all out in. The the grossness for the bog totally yeah and i thought it was fabulous and then again like you've got you get to the very end of the chapter by this point you've done strixhaven for eight to probably ten sessions with your players they're doing the thing and then the entire resolution fits in two paragraphs whether they succeeded or not and that's it yeah i was like oh come on that's give me more the the picture on that page is bigger than the text that they give you for both <laughs> options uh, about whether you succeeded or not they just they really how they spent their inches was very interesting sometimes so i don't know thoughts I think you covered it pretty well. I'm going to be honest. I knew you had strong feelings about this chapter and I was pleased that you went ahead and ran first because you kind of hit all of the points and summarized the fact that, yeah, again, we don't need to necessarily browbeat it, but there's yep. the same pattern. Some of it's, some of it's great. Some of it's meh. Yeah. And the ending definitely could have used, could have used a little bit of punch. Yeah. Just a little bit of, could have used a little bit of seasoning. We've been going on for a while here. Let's try to bring this to a head here then. We started with the first episode saying that we thought that some of the material in the outer chapters was weak and questionable, and we wondered if the quest would tie it all together. 
we started this episode tonight saying that we th- liked the quest more than we thought it was, and that it did indeed tie together some of the things while still leaving some loose threads here. So I'm going to ask the question that I, I've been asking a lot over the last couple of months, and that's if you take the Strixhaven book and you put it with everything else that came out in 2021. So we had Candlekeep. Tasha's was the end of 2020, so we're going to leave Tasha's out for right now. Candlekeep, Ravenloft, Fizbins, Wild Beyond the Witchlight, and now the Strixhaven book. Of those five books, where does this one sit? Third or fourth? Candlekeep? I would put it third or fourth. I like okay. it better. I like it better than Witchlight. Interesting. Just because I feel it gave me more in the quest material that I could work with, just the yep. way that it lit up my imagination. But I definitely Witchlight like was not the book we wanted. So yeah, I can see that. Candlekeep and Ravenloft, I both definitely put above it, and I can't. Well, decide I definitely on it. put one and two. Yeah. Yep. I can't. I, I can't decide on dragons between it and dragons. I'm going to be honest yep. because Fizben's Book of Dragons, it was good, but some of it was really oddly specific, and of course, it's about dragons. I don't know. I'm going to break the question into two parts because I just can't decide. If I am putting on my storyteller hat as a DM, I have Fizbins 1, Ravenloft 2, I have Witchlight 3, Candle really? Candlekeep 4. You'd put Candlekeep that far down. And honestly, Witchlight and Candlekeep, it depends on my moment. I could switch either of those two. And I'll be honest with you, it's because I'm so enjoying our Witchlight not having played it and basically only dealing with that as an observer at this point, other than my first, I guess, the lead-in I did. uh, Technically, But I'm enjoying it, and, and I'm looking forward to where that goes. Because I love Faye so much, there's a little bit more I'm going to do with that book than Candlekeep. Just a shade more yep and that's where i do and then after candle keep that leaves strixhaven last as a dm as a player i have ravenloft first because i just love the lineages and the things there like i want to play a dumb fear and then i go to candle keep yep because i love that as a player yep. love love that as a player and then from there i go to three which is strixhaven which shocks me a little bit but as i'm looking at this and going through this that's a legit placement and which light four and Fizbins five as a player. I think Fizbins is just that. It's a source book that's really a lot better for DMs than it is for players other than the Dragonborn, which I play a couple. So I love that element of it. But on whole, it's not as good a player book as some of the other ones. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm going with Glenn on this. I'm not gonna divide it out into storyteller and and character and players rather. I'm gonna put this probably fourth. I'm gonna put it at the bottom of the stack with Fizbins here, right? Because uh, it was not a book that resonated super strongly for me. Uh, but number one for me is gonna be Candlekeep. Number two is gonna be Witchlight. Number three, Ravenloft. But those are all. It's less one, two, and three, and a lot more of a one B, one C kind of thing. Because right. I really thought Candlekeep was an exceptional book. Um, I can't decide that, between Candlekeep and Ravenloft because Candlekeep's yeah. adventures and everything are written so they're so well. Yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, that's but I really, I love- really, really like the Ravenloft book and the and it was done well to expo as a reintroduction of the setting. Yep. I really like totally. it. So it's, those two are the toss up for me for one and two. But. And to be honest, that's what I loved most about kind of the first adventure in this book was that it seemed the way the adventure and the way the mystery was built felt very Candlekeep like. I right. really thought that they did a very good job with that. Just to put a cap on this a little bit here. Like I think that our assumption that the quest was going to tie together some of the ex- the the outside material that didn't jive was correct. That assumption was correct. It did try to tie it together. I think that we are again looking at a book that was the fifth major book in D&D 5e to come out in a year. And I think it showed it a little bit. I think it showed a little bit of of fatigue is the wrong word i think it showed a little bit of rush it showed rush a little bit of right. it it showed a little that it could have used another round of editing and it could have used a little more discussion about where the inches were spent honestly part of the reason that it is what it is you gotta know is going to be losing the ua when they scrapped their subclasses yeah. that was a huge section of what this book was going to be it had to be a scramble after that to put it together into a workable book and that's kind of what it feels like a scramble. It's got some great parts because they were written really well, and then they had to fill in a whole bunch because they lost their biggest player section. Yep. 
Yep. It almost makes me wonder if when they were kind of trying to decide if it was going to be a campaign or a source book or an adventure path, I wonder if the quest was kind of an afterthought because, again, some of the ideas in it just don't seem fully baked, right? It's like they're throwing a half-baked cake at us and, and half-baked cake is yummy if you want cake batter. But So funny enough, you know. my exact theory in my brain when I was thinking about this was that the parts of the campaign that are super well written, if it was trimmed so it no longer went over eight years and some levels and things were adjusted. Yep. If at one point it was a smaller campaign and the reason that the fill-in stuff that we're saying feels a little weak is because that's where a lot of that filler material was inserted. Because it was indeed filler material, yeah. Yeah, it may have once been a two-year program as opposed to a four-year program. Mm, or Intriguing. Maybe. Intriguing. Cool. All right, gentlemen. Final thoughts. Uh, Mr. Miller, why don't, uh, why don't you give us your final thoughts here? I like the idea of a mage college. I like the idea of players having this as their pre-story. I like that a lot. I don't know if 10 levels of pre-story is pre-story or not. Yeah, um, 10 right. levels of college. Yeah, which actually speaks a lot to Glenn's point. What if this was supposed to yeah. be one through five right. kind of thing and because they had to fill it out and make it a campaign book versus here's an adventure to get you started so now you're a fourth level character who yep. went to Strixhaven as a college which I think is really hot. A tenth level yep. by the time you graduate is whew. Yeah, I think it still raises the question about what do these characters do once they're done, right? Because if you've got a 10 le tenth level wizard that all of a sudden loses all of this relationship mechanic stuff that they've been basing on how do they function? What you do is you write you write season two when you go to uh, TNT for the continuation of your season or, of your show and, or season five, rather. And you are now teachers at Strixhaven uh, mm -hmm. for the next class. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. That works. Yeah, yeah. that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. But Or you find yourself a college graduate who can't get a job. So you're working at, you know. <laughs> You're relying on your barista experience from college. <laughs> you're, you're working at the you're working at the tavern. Afford, you're still the fire drill. <laughs> Magic components are expensive, man. How about you, Glenn? Final thoughts. I think we kind of took over Lee's final thoughts into a collective final thoughts, man. I think that pretty much put a pen in it. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Sounds fantastic, gentlemen. Thank you very much, guys, for joining me tonight. Always a pleasure to go ahead and, uh, and talk with you about this. I think we can, in good conscience now, put the curriculum of chaos to bed, having really read the entire thing and dove in here. I've been looking forward to this conversation for the last couple of days here coming up here and you guys certainly did not disappoint. I hope that this was as much fun for you as it was for me. So, um, no, it was definitely a good conversation. Absolutely yeah. great and I love Silver Quill. <laughs> you do love Silver Quill. You've continued to go ahead and say that. So everybody out there in the audience, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? Please, we would love your feedback on this as always. What, what are your thoughts on the Strixhaven book? There's been a lot of chatter on, on Twitter and on Facebook about it. What are your thoughts? Do you, Did we miss something here? Or if you're running the Strixhaven campaign, are you finding the same things that, uh, that we're seeing needed to be added to go ahead and really make this sing? We would love to have this discussion with all of you out there. Next week is... We have another awesome interview coming up. Friends from the Astronomica podcast are coming on for next week's episode. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care. Thank Later, you very guys. Much. Night. Good night. Thank you for joining us. This has been Tabletop Journeys. We would love to hear your feedback on our show today. You can join us at www.ttjourneys.com, where you can subscribe to the blog to leave comments and see all the content that we publish beyond the podcast. And make sure you join our growing online community. You can follow us on Twitter at TT Journeys and join us on Facebook just by searching Tabletop Journeys there. You can also reach us by email at podcast at ttjourneys.com. And if you want to catch early access to our episodes and some of the other benefits we have coming down the pipeline, you can also support our production at patreon.com slash ttjourneys. If you're listening to us on Stitcher, iTunes, Podchaser, Spotify, Audible, or any other podcast platform, we would really appreciate if you would like and subscribe to the podcast. Full episodes come out every week on Saturdays and every Wednesdays. We'll feature our side quest series where we talk about pretty much anything tabletop oriented. Thank you all so much for listening and for being a part of our growing community. And in the words of another traveler on our path, we bid you shade and sweet water.